Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome back from the lunch session. Welcome back from lunch. Uh, we're excited to have you back for FC Build. Hopefully you got to see Neha uh, from Confluent and Henry from Carta earlier today and sort of all the panels. Uh, for those of you who did miss those panels, let me quickly introduce myself and Foundation Capital, uh, and then we'll dive right in. Uh, my name is Ashur Garg. I'm a general partner at Foundation Capital. We're an early stage venture capital firm, 26 years in the business with a little over 30 companies that have gone public to our credit. Our two primary investing areas are fintech and enterprise. In enterprise, we've invested everything from applications all the way through to infrastructure, do a lot of work in cybersecurity, and we'll talk a little bit about that during the panel. We primarily invest before companies have revenues, and most of the time, in fact, before they have a product. So we're primarily seed in Series A. Our, our goal is to invest in dreamers who have extraordinary ideas, and we help them make those dreams real. So if that feels like you, you know, drop me or one of my partners an email. But talking of extraordinary dreamers, uh, let's talk, you know, let's start with the panel and talk about Nikesh. Uh, Nikesh began his career at Fidelity, where he was a VP in finance. He went on to T-Mobile, where he was CMO. Uh, he then joined Google in 2004, so very early, uh, leading Europe and eventually becoming the chief business officer for Google before he left in 2014. Uh, he then was president and COO of SoftBank. Uh, before he joined Palo Alto as chairman and CEO. Nikesh, you've held so many different functional leadership roles that we decided to call this panel the one-man C-suite. I'm still trying to find the right place to land, Ashu. That's what it means. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've done extraordinarily well, and thank you for joining us. My pleasure. I was going to joke that you know there are still a bunch of dreamers who are public with, I guess you said no revenue, that's hard, but no profit for sure. <laughs> that's for sure. That is for sure. Uh, well, Nikesh, I'd love to start maybe, you know, with a little bit about your life story. I noticed that you were born in Ghaziabad, a very small town in India. I, I actually grew up in Ghaziabad as well for a few oh, wow. years. And, and your father was an Air Force officer. Uh, so I'm sure you hopped around a little bit as well. Yeah, I think I went to seven, uh, seven schools in 12 years. Wow. So, uh, yeah, yeah. That was uh, a lot of hopping around. My father was in the Indian Air Force and... I guess when you hop around so many schools, you you learn to adapt. <laughs> and I, I I still envy my friends uh, who had friends growing up all the way from kindergarten. I, I didn't see the same kids. I have one friend who I, who Amit Singh, our president, who uh, who he and I went to high school together. And what are some of the ways that that growing up sort of influenced who you are today? Look, my my father was a lawyer. Uh, the integrity was very high on his uh, list, uh, and, and uh, you grow up, you absorb that uh, that those set of values from your parents, and and integrity is very high on my list. Uh, fairness is very high on my list. I always end up in tiffs with my spouse, where I keep telling her that's not fair, and she's like, "Life's not fair." <laughs> so, yeah, still, still, uh, still end up in those conversations, and uh, yeah, so those things become high on the list, and as you know, that growing up in India. It makes you resourceful because uh, it's a vast country with a lot of people and uh, scant resources. You've always got to find a way of getting stuff done. So you become good at problem solving and uh, it's competitive. I was joking earlier today. Uh, and my kids are six and five and, you know, they come back from school and say, oh, this is not about winning. It's about participating. Your child did a great job. And that wouldn't fly when I was growing up. <laughs> Yeah, I know from my days in Gazi, I mean, it's you definitely needed a lot of hustle. And you, if you weren't ahead of the pack, you were lost. That's right. Uh, it's a big pack. And it's a very big pack. It's a very big pack. You know, there's been a lot of talk on Twitter again in the last few weeks, especially because of the recent promotion of Parag, the CEO of Twitter, about the success of Indian Americans as CEOs. And, you know, what, what is it about that, that background? Uh, that, that has created so many CEOs. And you started to hit on that with sort of this notion of having to succeed in a big pack. But I would love for you to sort of build on that and talk about your perspective on the issue. Well, I could take two approaches here, uh, Ashu. I could call it statistics, right? There's 1.2 billion Indians in the world out of 7 billion. So proportionately, we should have as many CEOs of large tech companies. Uh, but I think to your point, you know, India was, uh, when I grew up, when I, took the exam for the IIT, there was 100,000 aspirants for 2,000 places. 
and uh, I think now there's 16,000 seats and there's a million people who take that exam. So it's it's uh, harder to get into IIT than it is to many of the schools in the world anywhere. So I think from part of that, there's a selection bias. You get some of the best people out uh, from an intellectual perspective. Uh, you get trained to be good engineers and problem solvers and statistically some of them make it to the top of the company. I guess that's, that's the best. I don't think it's anything particularly different. I don't think... Uh, there's a difference in CEOs who are Indian or American or Chinese. I think what's more interesting is, and you know, uh, it it validates for you the merit meritocracy in tech and yep. the meritocracy uh, associated with innovation. I mean, look what you guys do. You guys fund dreamers. You guys let people take risk. Then uh, this is a place uh, where you don't get penalized for failure. You stand up, you brush off, and you start again. Uh, you can. I'm sure you have many founders who've tried multiple companies. We hear about pivots. So I think part of it is more the culture here that allows that innovation, allows that meritocracy to exist. I think it's less about people who you know where you come from. Uh, no, I think that, that's, that's a great perspective. Uh, I'll keep moving a little bit to change topics. I mean, you were at Google from a in a very very seminal period in its history. You know, you joined just around the IPO. And in a period when the stock went up 10x and, you know, the company went from being searched to being a multi-product company. Uh, can you share some lessons from your experience as being part of that kind of growth? Well, look, you know, Google's a phenomenal company. I think uh, it's sort of, I, I would call it a unicorn, but unicorns are plenty nowadays. So <laughs> what I meant was it is one of a kind because uh, it, it had an immense stamp. It got a very early lead in the market and it continued to sort of build on that. I think the lesson there was that uh, when, when there's a juggernaut, don't get it, get, it, get in its way. Try and make sure you're facilitating the constant scaling and expansion. So it's a joke that when you worked at Google, you really didn't sell anything. You evangelized. You told people, a lot of people are going to search. Is it search for a keyword where you're going to monetize? Why don't you just put some money on the table that when that keyword hits, you, you're going to make, you know, you're going to get a lead. And, uh, you can do that in multiple multitudes of products at Google today. But I think that the part which was uh, rewarding was I was hired to run Europe. Europe was about 25% of Google's revenue at that point in time. And in the five years I was there, we made Europe 51% of Google's revenue. Wow. And uh, wow. We, don't have, we don't have that at Palo Alto Networks right now. We're at this 25% stage. In fact, I'm going to spend the next few years trying to take ourselves from that 25% to 50% number. So and, and that's not a... That's not a European problem. That's a Silicon Valley problem. The Silicon Valley problem is we take the best and brightest, hire them, drive the business to the U.S. closest to home, and then the business kind of has a long tail internationally everywhere else. I think Europe has as much demand, as much capacity, as much need, both on consumer tech as well as enterprise tech. But because majority of consumer tech and enterprise tech seems to emanate from this part of the world, it doesn't get there and get deployed at scale as rapidly as it gets done in the US. So that was the most rewarding part. I think the lesson there was that you have to create empowered regional uh, efforts to make sure those things scale. I mean, what else can I say? We could have a whole session about all the wonderful things that happened at Google and what you can learn from them. Is there one other, th I mean, I think the Europe thing is, is, is actually very impressive. I hadn't realized that it's 50% of revenues. Uh, and as you rightly pointed out, I think Figuring out how to operate in Europe is a huge challenge for most Silicon Valley companies. I see it in my own portfolio. Uh, are there two or three lessons if you go back in time to the early days? Uh, well, the other lesson is look, you know, who are trying to figure out how to work in Europe. Well, I don't know if it's a European lesson or it's a general management lesson, but look, um, you know, I, I, this was my second large scale management job. The first one was at T Mobile when I was chief marketing officer in my early 30s, and, and that was a whole lesson in itself. But this is where I picked up that you've got to have the best people working with you. And then people who were hired at Google Europe at that point in time, Philip Schindler runs chief business officer of Google now, he's run Germany for us. You know, Lorraine Tuhill is the marketing head of Europe, is now chief marketing officer of Google. Rachel Whetstone is the head of policy and PR at Netflix. She used to be my policy and PR person. So you can go down the list. And there have been some amazing hires both there and, and, and Google in, in the US that we had. And I think it just reinforces the need for great people in your team. If you spend the time to hire, work with, and enable the best people in the world, you end up with the best outcomes. And I think that gets 
that gets underappreciated sometimes in especially in highly successful companies because somehow it's it's never clear is it a rising tide lifting all boats or are those people actually you know creating the outcomes but uh, that's the second thing i'm very proud of some of those some of my best friends are people who i used to work with in google europe and some of the most successful people in silicon valley today you know and it, that is and, and that is very unique how many sort of folks from your team at google in europe have gone on to sort of take leadership roles both at google globally and then more broadly well there's more people that they were here too like you know claire johnson was a stripe dennis woodside is an impossible so there's a whole bunch of people the, the google alumnus who were in leadership roles uh five or seven years ago have done really well what are some of the lessons is is recruiting in europe the same as recruiting in the us what are any any you know suggestions again if you go back to the early days and what can what can other companies do uh to build the same kind of caliber of teams in europe well it's not a recruiting problem the recruiting is is kind of consistent around the world it takes the same amount of effort to hire great people wherever you go i think the biggest challenge comes in letting go um you know like company in the us you you focus a lot on the us but you want to control all the outcomes the fur- outcomes the further they get away from headquarters all code is created here all code is controlled here all product happens here so you know we're, we're exporting american product to everywhere in the world and sometimes it's important to think about it how would i look at it if i was french how would i look at it by the way there's no country called europe last i checked so it's almost like you have to go look at it on a country by country basis if you build a great product that works in germany it doesn't quite work in france so you literally have to take it on as an individual country by country bottom up project and understand what's the best outcome for that come was that country and typically where we get ourselves sort of in, in a bit of a bind as american companies is uh, we want to control the outcome here and there's many many ways you know when i when i went to google there was one head of international for a certain function and they covered 149 countries and there was one head of us that's like you know that either that person was highly skilled or we just hadn't hadn't bothered to worry about the other 149 countries and over time you know we went from us to english speaking countries and we went to i i forget the acronym but it had to do with the top 5 markets from a language perspective of google over time you start creating the scale around the world but it talks there's scaling there's resourcing there's empowerment there's uh funding all that stuff needs to go into play you literally have to make it work country by country you know i think it's 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 a great lesson i have a handful of companies that are in the 50 to 250 million in revenues and i see exactly the same issue where europe is 15 to 25% of revenues and yeah, but i'll give you an example you know we were having this debate earlier today it's like you know if you look at a new product and say okay this is a new product let's go make it successful in germany there's some guy in germany says well customer success hasn't been hard in germany yet because we don't have enough headcount in california well product has one engineer working here one se working there so and you go back and say the headcount of germany is 5 how many how many do we need to be successful you need 15 but you got to talk to 12 managers in california before you can get it fully funded it doesn't work as a model so what have you done uh, what did you do to change that i mean that we're is- working on it we're working on it we're looking at it and empowering the country leaders saying you tell me what you need to build a business this is what we did at google we said okay you're the entrepreneur who runs germany come back and tell me what you need to deliver these numbers now google has some benefit the product is pretty consistent around the world search works the same way pretty much everywhere in the world in some countries they, they read right to left but other than that you know you can you can get away with with a consistent product in many of the businesses that you know your your companies represent or us the product becomes different in every country because of local regulations because of certifications because of you know government requirements so there is a whole bunch of product adaptation needed but again that requires not just sales but also requires product adaptation which again goes back to what do you need to make a really successful business in this market it's it's it sounds like you do really have to think about each of these countries is as as not just a sales geography but as a as a business with, with, well yeah, there's 80 million people in the UK they don't consider themselves an offshoot of the United States <laughs> they have their own prime minister and stuff like that <laughs> <laughs> uh moving on to sort of follow also you know given your background at T-Mobile and Google and SoftBank you know cybersecurity is a completely different universe so what inspired you to join and take on the leadership role at Palo Alto well i i was saying this to one of our investors this morning that you know i didn't understand cybersecurity 3 years ago i'd never done enterprise other than that i was a perfect fit for the job and or had i been a public company ceo other than that 
it was a one to one match. Uh, like uh, in seriousness, uh, as you saw, I had I had before that experience all functions before, so I think that was the attractive part for for the team here. And they they said when I joined, there were five thousand people. Said so we have four thousand nine hundred ninety nine security experts. We need somebody who's not from security, but who can take this company to the next level. And I think. From my perspective, I had seen firsthand at Google the cloud revolution beginning to start. I had seen the reliance on technology based on all the customers spending money with us. So there is no there is no doubt in my mind that you know tech tech is going to enable pretty much every business today and in the future for for years to come. And you know even whatever was not tech enabled or whatever was not connected to the internet today is getting more and more connected to the internet. So who knows? We'll all be living in the metaverse, and you know life will happen that way. But uh, in that context, if tech is going to become more and more important, everything is going to get connected, you know, the bad acts are going to happen in a different way in the digital world. So to translate it into founder speak, it was going to have a huge time expansion. Uh, with a huge time expansion, uh, it, I, I contend cybersecurity is the most innovative industry in the world because the bad actors are always trying to find a new way to attack you. And the old way is solved, they're on to the next thing. Like, you're not doing it the old way again. So... That's why 3,000 companies get funded in security every year. So large TAM, constant innovation, um, not founded control. That was my personal criteria. I wanted to make sure that there was a stable set of shareholders. It was a professionally managed company, and Spot Alto had been for seven years with uh, <clears throat> my predecessor, Mark McLaughlin, who did a phenomenal job. So with those uh, with those characteristics, I said, okay, I'm only going to go join the company where I'm going to have fun. So love the board. Love the, the team. Uh, we spent some time reforming the team, and and uh, we're still going to build the first hundred billion cybersecurity company in the world. And so far, we, we got halfway there. We were we were one fifth of the way there. So every day gets a little better. Perhaps not today, but other than that, yeah. <laughs> no, it's been quite a run. I mean, you know, given the scale of the company, the the, the growth of the stock has been tremendous over the last uh, three years. And as you said, you know, we in venture we all joke. Cybersecurity is a gift that keeps giving. You know, every time you fund a company, by the time it's ready to go public, you're ready to fund the company that's going to replace that one. Well, I thought venture capital was a gift that kept giving. <laughs> well, it depends on the vintage. Right? <laughs> <That's right. laughs> you know, just building on the cybersecurity theme, you know, I was talking to someone very senior at Microsoft uh, just last week. Uh, and one of the things that was interesting, and, it's, and Microsoft has obviously dealt with this in recent years, is it's no longer a question of if a company will be hacked. I think most companies have now come to the conclusion that it's only a question of when are we going to get hacked and, and what do we do when that happens? Uh, what's your perspective? Is it, really, is it really going to be this unsolved problem and everyone's just preparing for that eventuality? Or, or do you think the world will look very different in a few years? Well, Asha, I, I, I try and give non-security analogies or, or more simplistic ones because I don't, you know, I don't want to get too technical on us. But look, it's kind of like saying, you know, is your house safe? Uh, yeah, my house is safe. Well, if two guys jumped over the wall and showed up with a gun, is it safe? Well, you can buy a gun. If two cars showed up with six people with machine guns, is it safe? Well, I need to go do some more fortification and. You know, if they brought a helicopter like they do in the movies and a whole bunch of people started falling, you know, coming down the rope, is it safe? So it's not. So my point is, it depends on who the aggressor is. You're as safe as as incompetent your aggressor is. Um, now, could you do a bunch of stuff? Yes. You, you can be not stupid. You can make sure from a high, you have doors and locks and you have windows and things that lock. You have an alarm system. You do all those things. So there's a lot of hygiene in cybersecurity. Uh, you got to make sure the hygiene is right. But then beyond the hygiene, the question is, what do I do when my hygiene is in place? I think cybersecurity as a problem is still not fully solved. I know you guys had Kevin Mandy up here before and he was talking about automation. I think he's right. I think the point is that I was trying to give an analogy to somebody else, saying, like, you know, the world lived in signature-based worlds. Like you, it's kind of like our badge. You know, I have a badge, I flash it at the door, it knows it's me, I have rights to come in and I can do whatever I want, right? That's my badge. That's signature based. You know who I am, therefore I'm okay. And signature based works very well in very bounded concrete problems where you, you can you, you control ingress and egress. The problem is in today's technology world, every customer can get into your system, everybody can upload and download stuff. So you live in a you live like you and as an analogy I guess, it's like going to a museum. You don't check everybody's badges in a museum, but you have very expensive paintings there. 
And the question is, you've got to watch everybody's behavior to see if I'm doing something naughty. You should be able to come and grab me and stop me there, and you can let everybody else go. So you have to go from signature-based to behavioral-based. To go to behavioral-based, I need to ingest a lot of data. I need to watch for patterns. Now, the good news is you can do it now. You couldn't do it 10 years ago. Yeah. Today, compute and storage is cheaper. Bandwidth is relatively easier to get. Latency is low. So suddenly, the entire processing of security needs to move to the cloud. And you need to deploy way more AI and ML against it versus behavior, versus, versus uh, I, um, signature-based or identity-based. So if the world is going towards that behavioral algorithm or paradigm, that's where you need to go create a whole new security paradigm where you're collecting data from every endpoint, every source, analyzing it on the fly, and stopping attacks from happening. That requires a fundamentally different security architecture. It needs a more consistent, less fragmented, single vendor Palo Alto architecture. Just kidding. No. <laughs> so I think that's where security needs to go. And hopefully in that environment, you'll have better luck in trying to stop uh, unknown attacks because that's where they're going to come from. So there's a lot that you said that we could unpack there, Nikesh. So I'll take it in a couple of different directions, but, but feel free to dive in as well. I think the, the shift to the cloud that you talked about, and, and you know, you were right, at Google, Google was pioneering that. And, and when you joined Palo Alto, it was very early days for, for security vendors in general and Palo Alto specifically in terms of embracing that move to the cloud. Uh, can you talk a little bit about where do you see that going from it from a Palo Alto standpoint, but also more from an industry standpoint? Well, you know, two or three things. First, uh, the two things which were happening at Palo Alto when I came, one, we had our own data centers. And I said, you know, we're like the equivalent of mom and pop stores when Walmart and Amazon come to town, right? And I, I, I think the AWS, GCP, Azure story is like Walmart and Amazon coming to town. And over time, it'll become economically impossible for us to run our own data centers, find the right resources, build the right tooling, build the right AI, and do everything ourselves. So we shut down our data centers three years ago and moved. It's more expensive on the margin, but it's a Ferrari compared to my Fiat Punto, right? I can be 150 countries. I can onboard, offboard traffic. They take care of all of it. But when AWS goes down, like you did yesterday, was it? Then everybody's got a bit of trouble. Other than that, we're in good shape. So Other than that, you're in good shape. Yeah, so that was kind of like the first piece of it. The other piece of it is if cloud becomes important, security changes. The infrastructure problem is now AWS and Apple, uh, Amazon and Microsoft's problem or Alibaba or Oracle. Uh, your problem is the application that sit in the cloud. And there's a very wonderful statistical rule. 50% of developers are better than the other 50%. So some people will write more secure software than the others. The question is, how do you manage the application security, the security that is of deploying the application in the cloud. So we focused on that three years ago. We bought five companies. We built a whole bunch of stuff. We have 1,700 customers in that space. And that's been that's been possible because we basically created a whole new team, yeah. put 500 engineers in it, or hired, acquired, added another 500 people in the whole go-to-market function. Now we have about 300 million ARR in cloud security, which makes us, we think, the largest cloud security player. I mean, it's, the, it's kind of like the first innings or not even that. I was trying to give a cricket analogy to somebody the other day. I said it's the first over, but then they said, is it a T20 or a one day or a five day? <laughs> you take your pick, it's still the first over, right? So from that perspective, we're in the very early part of cloud security, the cloud transformation. That is causing a whole network transformation shift. You've got to go redo your networks. So we're in the early stages of what the industry likes to call SASE. But I think the big prize is in the long term, ingesting the right security data in a consistent way and being able to analyze that in the cloud and being able to stop unknown threats. We kind of saw a teaser of that in the SolarWinds attack, where we had 20 SolarWinds servers at Palo Alto. We were, we were attacked. Uh, one, of the, one of the servers was trying to make a command and control connection to a server in Eastern Europe. We saw that anomaly was behavior able to stop it. That set us back to the drawing board. Uh, we have taken our mean time to remediate at Palo Alto down to a minute from 16 to 27 days. And now we're in the process of productizing that capability and seeing if we can make that more available to our customers in the next few years. One minute to respond. Wow, that's that's quite a bar to set for, for every other security company out there. We're a security company. If we can't protect ourselves, how are we going to protect our customers? So, you know, the other dimension of what you talked about is, you know, how much the product portfolio at Palo Alto has evolved in the last three years. You know, it's not just the shift to the cloud that's been an important part of it, uh, but you've been very aggressive 
in a good way about expanding the footprint from a product standpoint and leveraging the network and relationships that you have and the brand you have uh, from a go-to-market standpoint. You know, one of the questions that always raises for startups is, you know, they want to com- collaborate because, you know, in, in, in this new world, there will be multiple solutions. And they're also trying to figure out, you know, can they really collaborate or is it, is, are, you, are they always going to end up competing with Palo Alto? Depends. Uh, it's a perfect answer. You learned that in business school. Uh, it's a safe answer. Um, look, it, it depends. If there, if it's in a category where we don't play in and there's leverage for the end customer, more security, the end customer works. For example, very large space, identity and access management. There's Octoping, Duo, Centrify, uh, SailPoint, a whole bunch of people who do that. We don't do that. Do we collaborate? Do we have APIs that go back and forth? Yes, we do. So it works there. Um, email security. We don't do email security. Uh, well, Google does as part of their Gmail, uh, and Microsoft does as part of Office 365, Mimecast, Proofpoint. We don't do. We collaborate. Yes, we collect their data. We take the threats from them, put them in our threat database. Our customers can be protected off their firewalls of that threat database. So, yes, we can collaborate. There's a bunch of startups that collaborate by writing uh, workflows in our XOR product. So we have our XOR product deployed to thousands of customers. If you build a workbook, if you if you if, sorry, if you build a playbook where you're automating some of your own sensors and some of your own work, which you manage to tell your customer, you collaborate. So there are there is an ability to partner and collaborate. But I will also tell you on the flip side, Ashu, enterprise is such a tough business. I'm sure you've seen in your history that salespeople are barely able to sell their own company's product, let alone play sell somebody else's product. So I think the expectation is they will be able to take our product and sell it for us as effectively on the go-to-market front. It kind of like hasn't happened very successfully in the industry per se. I don't know a certain example where you know company A sells company B's product in same quantities as company B sells them. Yeah, no, I, I think that's fair. You know, in principle, we, we were having this conversation yesterday with Ali Godsey from Databricks, and, and they have taken, you know, a, a very, you could argue extreme, you could argue progressive stance where Ali said, we're going to sell products that directly compete with our products at the same margin using our, our, our channel. Uh, but it's really hard. It's just at a practical level operationalizing that when salespeople have so many different products already in the bag. Uh, I will be, I'll be sure to call my local Databricks salesperson and ask him for one of each. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a good experiment. Uh, you should do it. Your, yeah. your, your listeners should do it. I, I, I wasn't there. I didn't hear him. <laughs> it's just hard. I, it is hard. More, it is more hard. power to him. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so Nikesh, I'm going to sort of sprinkle in some of the questions that are coming in on the on the comments in the in the chat, uh, and then we can go back to some of my questions. But uh, there's been a bunch of questions from the audience around your comments in Europe. It really sort of struck a chord, I think, for some of the listeners. Uh, one of the questions says, you know, is it true that European companies buy fewer tools or fewer security tools? Uh, than American companies? And if so, what are the signals to look for before really investing in Europe? Well, I I don't know if it's true that they buy a lesser number of tools. I think the routes to market in Europe might be slightly different. I think Europe is, is more of a managed IT environment than the U.S. is. So you'll find that the telcos or the SIs or system integrators have a bigger role where Cap Gemini or Atos or Accenture or PwC is managing somebody's infrastructure or BT is providing network capability or eight or you know or Telefonica or France Telecom. So there's a lot more managed service component if every telco in Europe has a systems division. Germany has these systems and you know France has France has or in services. So they have very large tens of thousands of IT people and there's a lot more outsourcing in Europe that happens. So the route to market becomes through validating with the outsourcers whether they they should be deploying your product, which is a tougher technical conversation, right? Because now you're dealing with a 20,000 people technical organization, which has seven different competing tools they're going to play with, and they may choose to deploy your tool or not deploy your tool. Then you have to rely on them to go to market with them. So it's a slightly more arduous enterprise process than, than you might find in the US where you can go directly to customers. But having said that, there's, there's ample no- number of customers in each of those markets, which also do it themselves. Uh, it's just a challenge, as you can imagine, is like, you know, in a contiguous 
language and situation of 300 plus million people in the US, you can hire people and they're fungible across regions. But you know, if you hire somebody in Spain, they can't just drive across the border to France and sell in France because now they speak a different language and the technical standards might be different, right? The telco is different. So I think the problem is that Europe becomes, from a scale perspective, it looks less efficient than a U.S. model. Yeah, got it. And I think some of this, and, and this comes up in some of the questions that are coming up, it's also a question of where do you start in Europe? Logically, uh, people start in the same language, right? So England is the first, yeah, the U.K. is the first step. That, that's UK, a no-brainer. UK, UK is uh, pretty much always, if the U.S. is 50%, U.K. is 12% of revenue, yeah. right? Where would if you go from there? Future. Sorry? You have, where would you go from there for startups? If the jump from UK, that's the hard jump. UK is an easy jump in the grand scheme of things. Yeah, you look, Germany is a large market. It's a highly tech-enabled market, but it is it is a particular market. You've got to make sure you align with Deutsche Telekom as a local market. And you know, there's a certain there's a certain playbook you've got to deploy there. France is another big market that you can go deploy. Right? Uh, in Asia, Japan is a big market. Once you crack that market, it has tremendous amount of spending power. So you can literally go down the list and this is easy to figure out, the top 10 countries around the world. But typically what happens is, after the U.S., all prioritization goes out of the window. Right? It's you don't say, people. well, you say, okay, well, let's go to English-speaking markets, right? Then you start going to Canada and to Australia and U.K. and New Zealand, right? Well, wait a minute. New Zealand wouldn't make it in the top 20 from an economic perspective, but it's made it in the top five because it speaks the same language. So we also go, like, the, we also take the path of least resistance. That's fair. That's absolutely fair. Uh, there's also a string of questions, Nikesh, around sort of the transition that you made to Palo Alto, uh, given that it was a new sector for you. Uh, you talked about how, you know, they had 4,999 4, people that knew security. And so getting one uh, on board was actually perfect. Someone who didn't know security. But talk about how that worked for you. Uh, did you feel like you were at a disadvantage or did you feel like this was actually an advantage? I don't know. I, I'm trying to figure out if ignorance is bliss or it's uh, <laughs> it's it's a debilitating factor where you're constantly feeling bad. No, like it was. Uh, I had I had some. I was lucky. Uh, Nir Zook, our founder, is very very much present and involved, and and our head of product, Lee Clatter, is just phenomenal at what he does. And you know, my call driving in would be with with one of the uh, one or the other saying, "I heard all these things." And I'm going to be calling you every day for two hours on my drive in, drive out, and asking you all kinds of stupid questions, right? And and they're being very patient and very understanding. And you know, I learned how HTTP differs from HTTPS, and how does UDP work, and what does the firewall do? I, I it's a funny story. I won't name the person because uh, it may be too embarrassing for for it might become a story. But I, literally, my third day in the job, I was invited to the Morgan Stanley conference in Utah, so I went there. There are a bunch of security people. I I could spell security, but pretty much it. And I sat across from a CEO who we competed very aggressively and sassy and not hard to guess. Uh, and I said, hey, so tell me how your product works. I think he was just taken aback that you know, how, how you know, either this guy's really bad, stupid, okay. or he's got some angle which I don't understand because he's asking me, tell me basics of how your product works. It's like it's like maybe asking Sergey Brin and Larry Page. So, how does this search thing work? What does one do? And uh, that's where I started. I tried to ask a competitor CEO how his product worked, and he kind of gave me an answer. I still probably couldn't repeat it because I probably didn't understand most of it. I, I'm getting better. I can get to seventy percent, eighty percent understanding, and I understand our products really well. But I had a lot of help from my team. But again, look, I firmly believe Silicon Valley companies. I should be product first, right? A lesson you learn when you worked at Google, and Larry Page was very good at it, where he kind of said, you know, he reorganized his team. He put all the product leaders and his staff saying, I don't want to hear from the administrative and salespeople. I want to hear from product people because that's what's going to make or break a company. And he's right. Look, a thousand more good salespeople is not going to help you sell a shitty product in the market. So at the end of the day, product wins. So you got to make sure you have the best product. So I spent, I bought all 15 companies myself without a banker, I've met 350 cybersecurity startups in my last three years. So I learned. And at some level, I have to turn to my tech people saying, do you like the tech? Does it work? Yes, it works. How does it work? Explain it to me. And I, I, you know, I can get close. I may not be able to code it, but I can get close and tell you what's going to work, what's not going to work. And you know, everybody has their, their skill set. I have, I have uh, a phenomenal ability to consume PowerPoint and decide what's important. 
So I did that. And uh, my job is to keep focusing on the team. My job is to keep looking for holes and making sure that doesn't sound right. And I keep digging and digging to find out where the flaw is. And you go back and the team go back, so goes back and reworks it. So my job in management is to make sure that we're in the right segment, right space, big TAM, right product, product market fit. I'll call customers. I bought my first five companies by talking to 25 customers and seeing what they were deploying, not to my team. I'm like, those guys, are all, they're all deploying Twistlock. You guys are saying you're working on a container security project. That project will be three and a half years behind them because they're three and a half years ahead of the market. Why should we buy them? So, Nikesh, the lesson I'm taking away is every time we want to sell you one of our companies, we just got to get our customers to call you. If you have enough. <laughs> <laughs> but you told me you do no revenue stuff, so that would mean no <laughs> customers. We invest no revenues. Hopefully, they have some revenues at some point. <laughs> got, it, got it. The good news is... Uh, People don't sell companies to me. I buy companies. That's that's well said. That is well said. Uh, there's another question around, you know, we, we started off on a discussion and you had, a, you know, a very, very strong, and I think a very clear point of view on where is cybersecurity headed? Uh, you know, the shift to the cloud, the shift from identity to behavioral uh, analysis. Uh, but there's a question of what are some of the other future bets that you're making on one dimension? And secondly, what are the areas within cybersecurity that you feel like are saturated and, and there isn't that much scope for innovation? Look, there's always scope for innovation, right? I mean, but you've got to look for the inflection point. If you, when I came three years ago, there was an established firewall market, an endpoint market, and the firewall market is established and there's incremental innovation that we all do in that space. And people who are not keeping up are slowly withering away and getting replaced by people who are keeping up or staying ahead. So that's an evolutionary market. And nobody's sleeping. We're not sleeping on our laurels. We're continuing to innovate and continue to apply. Like, we introduced telemetry in our firewalls two and a half years. I said, where's the data? We introduced it. We started moving our subscription services to the cloud. Because if you don't innovate, you run into an inflection point where somebody comes back with a brand spanking new concept and say, holy shit, these guys are going to take the market and run it. That's what happened with the next generation firewalls with Palo Alto. Like Palo Alto was not the first player in firewalls in the industry. So you've got to be careful if somebody come, doesn't come in out to innovate you. That's why you keep staring at the market and every one of these companies that you guys fund to make sure you understand what's going to work, what's not going to work. And sometimes you've got to wait because sometimes people get all enchanted by that innovation and they keep doubling down and suddenly find out, holy shit, okay, this thing's not going to work beyond a billion dollars. So... So you got to watch out for the core area. And once in a life, once in, once in a while, either technological innovation or inflection points in IT hand you a gift. Our gift was cloud, right? If cloud hadn't come around and AWS, GCP, Azure were not clipping it and they were all watching it, all the legacy cybersecurity companies saying, wow, none of these guys are making a move, right? So then we went big. It's funny part is, I'll show you if you looked, we have, we have a slide we showed once at an earnings call. After the first seven acquisitions, we can tell you an industry we make an acquisition in, our competitors make an acquisition in the, the same category over the next. So that's a good thing. Like once we buy a company, you can sell your companies. I know, I know. We, uh, we've been noticing. Yeah. So, so I mean, I think part of it is you got to stay on top of it. We found the inflection in cloud. And I think the other inflection is going to be in data normalization and, and, uh, and behavior analytics. Now, you got to watch out. There's a very interesting, you know, and I apologize for the for the the old analogy, but this is the Ford analogy of, you know, if you ask all the customers, you know, how can I improve the chariot? They ask you for a faster chariot. Nobody's going to imagine a car until you're going to buy a car. So once in a while, you got to step back and say, I have to come to the security market with an opinion, and I've got to wait for that category to be created because I'm going to redefine it. Now, those opportunities also come rarely, and we believe we're going to do that in the in the SOC SIM space over time. But again, that requires scale. You can't do that as a startup, right? We need to be able to take 75 data sources, ingest them, run them against behavior analytics. We control 15 of those sensors. So it makes it easier, easier for us to go get the raw data. Like, you know, a third-party XDR vendor is not going to give you, we collect 150 megabytes of data per endpoint for our customers. We give alerts and APIs. We don't give that data to anybody else because it's using for internal processing. But if I can take that raw data and cross-correlate that with the other data sources I have, I get a much better security outcome bar none. Yep. So we're going to leverage our capabilities because there, otherwise there are startups out there with such smart people trying to out-innovate the hell out of everything. And you know, we feel like, the we look like the legacy guys. We don't feel like them. <laughs> well, we're definitely funding startups, you know, that will, that will 
hopefully give you a run for your money there. I um, hope you are. I hope I hope there's the next generation of Palo Alto networks out there. Uh, you know, there's perfectly fine. You can you can have an uh, you know, I'm, I'm sorry to drop down to to an Indian analogy, which I apologize for. You know, Amitabh Bachchan is still strong at his current age, and so is his son, a great actor. So you just want to be that. I, I, I was watching I, a movie I, with my wife on the weekend, so <laughs> that's I brought up. You know, I'm going to change topics in you a little bit. Uh, going, you know, zooming out of cybersecurity in Palo Alto specifically, just given the varied experiences you've had. Uh, to talk a little bit about culture, mm -hmm. you know, uh, many people would argue that really it's it's culture that in the long term separates the great companies from the also rants. And, and Google definitely had a very strong culture. You know, SoftBank in its own way has a very strong culture. T-Mobile uh, has a very strong culture. Uh, so tell us a little bit about your perspective on culture. You know, actually, that's a great question. And I spent a lot of time thinking about it, um, and especially for your audience. Organizations take on the form of their leader. And if you go back and look at Facebook, you look at Google, you look at Uber, you look at, you look at all the successful companies of our lifetime, and you write down the characteristics of the individuals who built them and ran them, and map that to the company culture, you'll find a 50 to 70% overlap. Yep. Because that's what people role model. Because most startups don't have it written down. Like very few startups say, here's our 10 cultural tenets. You typically write that two or three years after you're successful because, you know, when you're out there fending for each product capability, you're like, dude, build product, sell it to customer, make it work. Right? That's our culture, right? We do it fast. So you come up with all this fail fast, fail often, and 10x everything, all that stuff happens afterwards, after you've had a little bit of time to breathe and say, I just raised my round at 5 billion, let's go write the cultural document. And I'm, I'm being facetious, but you understand my point. But you know, you're absolutely right, yeah. Culture doesn't hit the first, you know, doesn't hit the Maslow's hierarchy until you start seeing some degree of sustainability. So I think from that perspective, culture already starts in your startup based on how you act. And it's important, and it's hard because... I literally, you know, once in a while, on, 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 as a side hustle, I invest in startups on my own, not like you guys, but I have about 25 investments. And once in a while, the CEO will come and ask me. And then oh, the CEO walked in and said, yeah, I have the secondary sale. I can do it at this price. I can do a primary at this price. I'm like, dude, life's long. People will find this out. They'll remember. What's most important is your integrity, right? Whatever you do, do it in with high integrity that it ever sees the light of day. People say, what a great guy. So... Culture starts right at the beginning from day one as you hire your first employee and how consistent you are in the way you behave. And over time, you learn and you evolve it in a good way. So that's what culture means. At Palo Alto, the culture was very great. It was amazing, defined by the founders. My predecessor, phenomenal gentleman, Mark McLaughlin, went to West Point, very high integrity. That's the other part I loved about this place. But I've really gotten religion around culture in the last few years I've been here because not only is it my behavior that I have to role model constantly that people have to see, uh, we were lucky because... I could draw on 6,000 people. I made them write the culture document. They wrote it. And I'll tell you, it takes a lifetime to build the culture. It takes a few days to destroy it. It's like a reputation. So we 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 have toiled in the last two or three years. Um, we, we stay in touch every Monday morning. I do a 50-employee roundtable arbitrarily from the company. They are chosen. They come. I wake up on Monday morning. 50 people give me feedback, and I tell them, 30 seconds what you love about it, two minutes what I can fix. And I, and I get jolted back into the company. I write them down. They all get responses. It all gets taken care of. They get part of the work stream if they have to go fix something. So there is this constant learning, constant uh, fixing culture we have. Uh, and it's showing dividends. You know, Our employees are hopefully happy. All the internal feedback suggests they are. So uh, my only advice to people who are listening is it starts from you if you're the leader of the organization. It starts from you if you're the leadership of the organization. It starts from you if you're an employee because you're role modeling it to somebody who watches you. I, I think it's so well said. You know, I, I had one of these, my portfolio companies a few years ago. They were around 10, 15 million in revenues and they they hired a consultant to do a culture doc. And, and in hindsight to me, that was, you know, that, that, that was their peak as Rome. That was, that was the beginning of the downfall. Uh, it really is about what you do and what, not just what you say and what you write. Uh, what advice do you have 
for you know for founders out there that we have a lot of cybersecurity founders in the audience today uh you know at Palo Alto you've really created a role model for so many of them what advice do you have for cybersecurity founders for on people and cultural issues where do you think they should focus you know what would be your parting advice well like look depending on where they are in the maslow's hierarchy of startups <laughs> that, there's another document you could write you know there's a Maslow hierarchy for human beings and one should be for startups. But if you believe you have a product, your product market fit, obviously you're out there going to sell it. But I suspect, you know, I say this in a different context. If you make a meal in 15 minutes, it tastes a certain way. If you spend two and a half hours making a great meal, it tastes better. So my fear sometimes what I see in cybersecurity is that there is this huge mad rush to go out with a product because you want customer feedback. And typically, the customer feedback you try and get is from some of the largest customers who have time to tinker with it. Largest customers may, hey, you know what? Just give me this data as an API. This is great. I'm going to go use my 10,000 engineers to integrate into my back end. And you end up with financial services and government, which have large engineering teams. And you often end up with a highly technical, very enterprise great product, which doesn't look very easy for mid sized companies to deploy. So, my only, my only request to all of you guys is think hard about your product, build a great product. The great, the the better the product you build, the higher the probability you can scale it in the market over time. The biggest challenges I've had buying 15 companies is that we literally had to revamp some of their product development effort because at scale, I can't send the founder to every company to sell it. So focus on the product. Do, do, you know, in some ways, what I hear you saying is the build fast, fail fast, while makes a lot of sense, you know. Doesn't necessarily always work, especially in cyber. Yeah, but you know, I think. Like, sorry, apologize. I know we're running out of time, but no worries. If you were building a car, you wouldn't ship a chassis without the wheels. But in 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 enterprise, sometimes you ship the chassis and say the wheels are coming. I think that's great advice. With that, Nikesh, thank you so much for your time. Uh, this has been a fabulous conversation and truly inspiring for so many founders out there that are looking to build the next Palo Alto Networks. They want to be the Abhishek to your Amitabh. Thank you, Ashu. Good luck to everyone. And thank you very much for, for sparing the time to listen. Thank you.